in His own hand. Few individuals have influenced our personal lives and those we live with as much as the man from Galilee. Yet, separating fact and allegory, metaphor and superstition from this humble carpenter has remained quite problematic for over 2,000 years. Now, miraculously, we have discovered a Rosetta Stone to help clarify our vision of this Christ. And this is the story of that stone. The air that evening was sweet with sweat and olives as he examined the inscription on the piece of leather. When your tallest buildings fall like saplings, and terror spreads from roots of fear. When martyrdom is used for killing others, you'll know these words were meant to hear. Judas tucked the scroll securely in his robe and looked at Jesus. Tears began to well up in his eyes. I will miss you, Master, more than you will ever know. Jesus, too, was moved to tears as he hugged Judas, his disciple, the man that had become his closest ally and his dearest friend. Go, he said to Judas, take the scroll and do my bidding. The next few days will be the toughest ones for us both, my friend. May my father be with you always. Judas looked across the Garden of Gethsemane and signaled the Sanhedrin. Then he hugged his best friend and spiritual teacher one last time. Just as Jesus was being arrested, he bolted into the night with shouts of traitor close behind him. Judas ran full speed along the dusty road in the moonlight. He stopped at the predestined place and greeted his friend Michael from the ascetic order of the Brotherhood of the Essenes. As they embraced and Judas handed him the scroll, Michael looked into the eyes of a tired and weary warrior a man who carried the heavy weight of knowing that he had just sent his best friend to his death. Is this the document from Jesus? asked Michael. Yes, and that piece of leather around it carries strict instructions as to when it should be opened. Then they shall be observed, even if it means protecting it with our lives. When Judas learned centurions had wrapped a crown of brambles around the head of Jesus, he realized the full extent of what he had done. Unable to contain his bitter sorrow a day longer, he hung himself. About 200 years after the death of Jesus, the Romans killed the last to seen. In 1947, as much of the planet was still in the process of rebuilding itself after a brutal world war, a collection of 600 Hebrew and Aramaic manuscripts were discovered in a group of 11 caves in Jordan at the northwestern end of the Dead Sea. These became known as the Dead Sea Scrolls, and the documents themselves, believed by historians to be the main body of the Essene Library, date from the mid-3rd century B.C. to 100 years after the birth of Christ. The primary scrolls were discovered by Bedouins and purchased in part by the Hebrew University and the Syrian Monastery of St. Mark, both in Jerusalem. Although the abbot of the Syrian Monastery, Hassan Nadarun, was under great pressure to sell the scrolls as monastery owned to the government of Israel, he did not immediately transfer the documents. One of his archivists had uncovered a scroll he suspected might have been written by Jesus. Fearing such a document might fall into the hands of Israeli bureaucrats, the abbot hid this one scroll before he signed the release papers. A week later, with scroll in hand, Abbot Nadarun boarded a plane for Washington, D.C. to meet with Father Richard Kern, professor of biblical studies at Georgetown University. He knew he could trust Father Kern, the two had corresponded for many years on issues related to translating ancient Hebrew and Aramaic writings. What the abbot didn't know was that he would have a stroke within 24 hours of touching down at Dulles International Airport and that he would never fully recover. 
He did make sure, however, that the scroll was in Father Curran's hands before he died. The scroll was now his, and so was a thorny problem. Father Curran was a Jesuit, a Catholic order with a long tradition of education and scholarship. The scroll was the kind of project he and his colleagues spent their professional lives dreaming about, but Curran would spend the next five years proving the document's authenticity without a word to anyone. You see, he understood the directive by Jesus that the document should not see the light of day until all the conditions stated were present, and Curran found no evidence of that in either 1947 or 1952 when he had completed his work. So although he was elated he had seen the writings, he was disappointed he could not share them. He put the scroll in a safe deposit box, wrote instructions to two individuals on how to retrieve the document in the event he should die prematurely, and went about his life. Richard Curran left the Jesuits in 1956, married his high school sweetheart, and got busy raising a family, two boys and a girl. He died a very happy, grateful man three years ago at the age of 76. I was at his bedside. I'm his son, Mark Kern, a Catholic priest working with migrant farm workers in Northern California. A year before my father died, he gave me the scroll and its history. Last night I shared the contents of the scroll with my bishop, a rare and very special man, and I asked for his advice. He smiled and said, It may be helpful to remember that not one person in this vast organization was on that killing field 2,000 years ago. Not one of us ever felt the pain or terror of that man who voluntarily let himself be nailed to that tree. (laughs) Besides, a little house cleaning seems to be in order for that bloated aristocracy in Rome, don't you agree? So we've called a press conference for tomorrow at 1 p.m., But before you hear it from the media spin doctors and religious analysts, I thought you might like to get it straight up, so to speak. These are the words of Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ, the only words we have in his own hand. The nature of God is absolute. It is not confined or constricted by any church, doctrine, or book regardless of the author's intent or inspiration. The nature of God is expansive and all-inclusive. It has no understanding of this or that or of religion. In a word, it is glorious. The nature of God is pure creativity. It seeks to examine its own divine nature by creating more of itself. The nature of God is compassion. It is neither punitive nor vindictive. The nature of man is the spirit of God taken form. The nature of man is without blemish. We arrive in a state of majesty and glory. From that moment forward, we create our lives such as they are. As children, we begin to develop ego bodies. As these bodies solidify, we become convinced we are separate and distinct from the Spirit of God. This is neither good nor bad. It is simply part of the human experience. As we grow older, we sense something is missing. This is our memory of the Spirit of God. Although the Spirit has never left us, we are distracted by the incessant vain demands of her ego body and the constant seductive intoxicating drumbeat of the marketplace. To rediscover the Spirit of God, man must begin by doing that which is always the hardest, honoring the self. This is the ultimate irony and for many the most difficult challenge of life. The realization that to get beyond the ego body, you must first embrace it. In short, there is no way to rediscover the Spirit of God without first loving yourself unconditionally. You can give all your money to the poor and spend your life caring for the needy, but without honor, love, and respect for all that you are, including your myriad imperfections and past errors, you will not find your way home during this great journey. 
The rediscovery process, although unique for everyone, has the same foundation, turning the stream of compassion within, the practice of stillness, and finally surrender. The cycle of birth and death is a natural and essential part of the human experience. Those who were fortunate enough to experience birth will also be fortunate enough to experience death. The time we waste fearing death can be put to much better use. It is only your ego body that will suffer biological death and decay. The Spirit of God is never born or dies. Thus, nothing extraordinary will happen at the moment of death. We will simply shed our ego body and return in full to exist as the Spirit of God. Every moment I listen for your voice among the billions. For your voice alone has its own uniqueness essential to this moment. We call the universe. Remember who you truly are. Take solace in knowing that I am always with you. I have never deserted you. I never will. And know too that my feelings for you have never diminished. You and I will always be best friends.